Hi everyone. Uh, sorry for the rearrangement. Um, my name is Xin Liu, and that's my website. There's three. Sorry, three, three, three is on nine total acts. There's just help with visually understand what's going on. Um, so my name is Xin, uh, and this is me when I was about three years old, and it's me last year in Beijing. So it's interesting for myself even to look at these pictures. Like, okay, I came from that then all the way came to right now like but all the time for my lifetime like I always know like who I am right like no matter I'm a baby or I'm, uh, I'm running or I am jumping around or doing math or now sometimes do some performance I always know that's myself but it, as you can say that physically I change so much so uh, the same thing applies to everyone here how do you know yourself is always the continuous uh, identity things you were born and that's the kind of thing I'm interested in um, Professor uh, Craig uh, AD from Arizona State University he proposed an interesting framework where he basically tells us like the self-image the idea of how I perceive myself is kind of a progression is a temporal uh, progression that constantly change so without going too deep in the neuroscience or cognitive science if you're interested I can send you the paper uh, I want to summarize and simplify the idea into more like a feedback system because I'm an electronic engineer so it's like we constantly gather data from all the stimuli in the world and also even from ourselves and, and then, then we, we get, get the data and we do a feedback, feedback loop system so we know what we were last minute before and we know what's going on next so I just cut my hair this morning so I, I know what happened so when I see myself with a shorter hair in the image I won't be like whoa what happened right so that's kind of the whole idea I'm trying to first convey so that I the image of yourself is a constant changing progression so what can we do with it? The interesting thing is that if we're getting data from the environment and those data is changing our way to think about what we can be, maybe we can hack into that feedback system. Maybe we can provide like different stimuli. So this is a project I did when I was a master's student in a media lab, and it's called uh, Mask. And the, the goal of the project is very simple. I want to change how we think of our, ourselves and we're with a very simple method. So this is how uh, I was trying to do uh, first. Uh, with a very fast and precise uh, temperature sensor, I was able to get your breathing activity. Not just like uh, how many breaths you took in a minute. It's like when it starts, when it ends, and the kind of, the, even the dynamic of it. I was trying to sense it. And then when I get that data, I fit it into my system, and I generate a synthesized sound of the breathing and I feed back to the person through bone conduction uh, speaker. But why, why do I do it? Because like if I ask you, how was your breath last minute, like last second ago, you, you probably don't have a very good idea. But at the same time, the way we breathe really change the way we feel about ourselves. So for example, when I'm giving a talk, if I feel like I'm breathing heavy, or like I'm actually breathing very calm, I probably have a very different idea about how am I doing right now. Am I nervous? Am I calm? Am I like be able to handle the situation. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to provide a false feedback to the user of how themselves is behaving in a biological way. So this is a sensor at the nose and it's the blue uh, little like bone conduction speaker. Uh, it's useful using bone conduction because it gives you a sense of like the sound is coming from yourself. So uh, in order to test the system and to really see, okay, even if I hear the sound you produced to me is not very necessarily what I actually breathe is like. What can I do? And we did two studies uh, with uh, 20 adults. We did two things. First, we asked them to do GRE tests because I went through a lot of struggle when I apply for the grad school, so I asked my subjects to do the same thing. And I was like, okay, do the GRE test and wear the device, and we provide them the sound. And turns out people who heard their fake breathing sound in a more faster, rapid way feel much more uh, anxious and anxiety afterwards, after a test, compared to people who just hear like a normal calming sound. It sounds very uh, reasonable. Of course, if I'm hearing myself breathing really heavily, I feel like, okay, okay, I probably don't know what's going on, I get more and more nervous. But have to 
I have to remind you again, again like all the sound you hear in the beginning was fake. It's not even yourself. Can we do even more than that? Can we influence people like beyond just getting someone nervous? So another study we did is like we recruit a bunch of uh, very healthy straight male adults, and then we show them the pictures of women and ask them to just tell us like, oh, how do you think about the physical attractiveness of the women? And uh, we also have two set, uh, two groups, and one of one group of them, like one day, uh, rate the women halfway. We gradually change the way they hear their breathing. It gets heavier. It gets faster. And then, as you can expect, statistically, the subjects they rate a woman more attractive when they hear their own breathing sound is more like intense. And while uh, we didn't do a reversed version uh, from women to men, there is a little bit more like a study and background about it. If you have a question like burning, uh, come to ask me after the talk. So basically, this is a device. It's really uh, something I was trying to do about like connecting the conscious bodily signals to our emotions, like kind of altering the reality by changing how you think about who you are. So if I think I'm a confident uh, person, maybe I feel everyone here is very friendly, you're smiling at me, and I'm doing a good talk. But if I think I probably don't know what's going on at all, now no matter people look at me, I'll be like, oh, you probably hate me. So it's really interesting for me to think about like how the perception of self is really changing the way we look at the world. So as a summary, I think, uh, one of my favorite uh, philosopher, Evan Noe, he once wrote that as organisms, uh, much of our lives is structured by primarily uh, like this pri uh, primitive activities that are uh, life-supporting, uh, spontaneous, and involuntary. We are observed into such activities, and they form our biological uh, natures without even letting us know what's going on. And we ignore it. We always think what matters is like knowledge or rational ideas. But we're so irrational in every single aspect. For me, hungry is a very big problem, for example. Like, so when we became more and more measurable daily, nowadays we wear devices, and they always on and giving us idea about how many steps you're walking every day. Uh, did you drink enough water? They are, in fact, also altering the way we perceive ourselves. So here, in the, in the end, I really want to encourage everyone to re think more a little bit while you're trying to design this kind of alternative uh, realities or alternative ways for one to perceive themselves. Let's to be more sensitive, uh, thinking about what does it mean to the subject. Uh, and be sensitive at the same time like for yourself every single individual, to all those kind of spontaneous and involuntary activities that is undertaken every moment. Because those little step, and little heartbeat, and breathing activities, they do not just support our life, they also define who we are. Thank you very much.